um, so proud of you, Huli, and have been just elated to see the book's reception. Uh, we were all we were supposed to host the launch party for the book, I think on March 13th, like right before Shelter in Place happened. I think it was like our second event that we postponed and we like called it like that afternoon. We were all just so excited for the event that we wanted to like risk our lives to like host the event. We didn't, we didn't know. Um, but I'm glad to finally be doing this and um, joining Huli tonight is more royalty. We have Daniel Handler. Um, who is the author of the novels We Are Pirates, The Basic Eight, Watch Your Mouth, Adverbs, and Why We Broke Up, which was the 2012 Michael L. Prince honor book. He's responsible for many books for children, including the 13-volume sequence, A Series of Unfortunate Events, and the four-book series All the Wrong Questions. He's married to the illustrator Lisa Brown and lives with her and their son in San Francisco. And Juli Delgado Lopera is an award-winning Colombian writer and historian based in San Francisco. They are the author of Kirame which was published by Nomadic Press in 2017, and the illustrated bilingual oral history collection, Quintamilo, um, which came out um, with Ant Loot Books in 2017. And that book won a 2018 Lambda Literary Award and a 2018 Independent Publisher Book Award. They're the recipient of the 2014 Jackson Literary Award and have received fellowships from the Brush Creek Foundation of the Arts, Lambda Literary Foundation, the Urban Winner Center for the Arts, the SF Grotto, and an individual artist grant from the SF Arts Commission. The work has been nominated for a Pushcart Prize and has appeared in 1111, Foglifter, Four Way Book, uh, sorry, Four Way Review, Broadway, Broadly, and Time Out Mag, among others. Formerly, they served as the creative director of Radar Productions, a queer literary nonprofit in San Francisco, um, and did such a good job with that. Um, a little bit about the format um, before we start, we'll have a short reading followed by a conversation and a Q&A at the end of the program. Um, I encourage you to um, ask any questions that you have for Huli and or Daniel um, in the chat at any point and we'll pass them on. Um, also, uh, for those of you who are here with us on the Zoom, um, uh, obviously you're muted, but we encourage you to show some love for the authors, share your most excited faces, Make some spirit fingers, some thumbs up, whatever, however you can share your love, please do that. Um, I'll be moderating the chat. So um, I just want to say we have a one strike policy. Um, please, nothing hateful, all love here, um, or we'll have to remove you and you won't be able to get in, um, to get back in. So please don't do that to yourself. Um, I think that's it for me. Uh, I'll share links for the books um, in the chat. Um, but I'll turn it over now to Huli and Daniel. I'm so happy to have you guys here with us. Um, I've been looking forward to this for like a hundred pandemic days. Which are <laughs> long days. Um, thank yes. you and congratulations, Huli. Thank you. I'm so hooray, excited hooray. to finally be doing this. Um, thank you so much, Evan. And I am like so thrilled um, to be joined by Daniel. We've been trying to have a conversation since April. Um, and so it's been like we've been postponing and I'm postponing it, but I'm very thrilled. Uh, I'm super excited to be here. And so I'm going to be reading something very short before Daniel and I have a conversation. I'm going to read something really short. Um, and I just thought that I was going to start with the beginning of the book. So we're just going to read the first pages. If you have the book, I'm just starting on page one. <clears throat> it's chapter uno. Buenos días, mi reina. Inmigran criolla here reporting desde los Miami from our aunt infested townhouse. La Tata have drawn directing me this holy radio novela brought to you by Female Sadness Incorporated. That morning, as we unpacked the last of our bags, we found Tata's old radio. So the two of us practiced our latest melodrama in the living room. And on the TV, Don Francisco saluted el pueblo de Miami, damas y caballeros. And Tata, at this age, to mommy's exploration and my delight when girl crazy with his manly voice. Y como quien no quiere la cosa, mommy angrily turned up the stove where la tata had left the bacalao frying unattended. Then lights will spray the countertop, smashing the dark trail of ants, hosting some pancito for their colony behind the fridge. Girlfriend was pissed. She hadn't come to the U.S. of Bay Tokyo ants and smelled like puto pescado. And how lovely it would have been if the housekeeper could have joined us on the plane. Then mommy could leave her to the household duties and concentrate on the execution of this migration project. Pero aló, is she the only person awake in esta berraca casa? 
on the TV, another commercial for Inglés Sin Barreras. And Lucia La Tata and I chuckled at the white people teaching brown people how to say, hello, my name is, hello, I am going to the store. Hello, what is this swamp? Please come rescue us. It was April and hot. Now that the heat dissipated in June or July or August or September, or even November for that matter, the heat, I will come to learn the hard way, is a constant in Miami. El calorcito didn't get the impermanence memo, didn't understand how change works. The heat is a stubborn bitch within its humid mouth on your every pore, reminding you this hell is inescapable and in another language. We have been here for a month, newly arrived, still saladitas, and I already wanted to go back home to Colombia, return to my Panela land, its mountains, and that constant anxiety that comes just from living in Bogota. That anxiety that I nonetheless understood better than this new terrifying one. My mommy explained to me over and over with a smirk, look around you, has Francisca, this is your home now. Our to-do list that doomed Saturday of the ants and the bacalao, including helping mommy with the preparations for the baptism of her miscarriage to that baby, Sebastian. It has been argued by the only people who get to argue, La Tata and her hermanas, that my dead brother's baptism was the most exciting event in the Martinez family that year. This is mainly because La Tata drank half of a bottle of rum a day, couldn't until Monday from Friday, so obviously a fake baby's baptism at a pastor's school was more important to say, to her than say, the fact that by the end of the month, my young sister Lucia was regularly awakened in the middle of the night to pray over me. Or the fact that I will eventually remember this time, the first month after our arrival at mommy's most sane and grounded moment. But we're getting ahead of ourselves, Cachaco. Primero la primaria. And I'll stop right there. Yay! <laughs> Ooh, there I go. Yes. Um, I'm so excited to um, think about this book as I've been thinking about it since you first tossed it to me. And I'm really glad that there are people here who are um, tuning in and I hope that they will spread the word about what a marvelous and fantastic book this is. I've been excited about it for months. I'm so glad that you're here. And there's something I want to start this book to me has like a defiant joy and it had like a defiant joy in the face of trouble and treachery this like joy and happiness that was is unforced that feels so heartfelt and that was something that i really got from the book when i read it and this was like before we lived in the land of like pandemic shit. so i guess where i want to start is like what is the What's your position on like finding joy and defiance? Where does that energy fit into the world we're living in now? Yeah, I mean, I'll start, um, I love that you quote that because I do feel that part of her own sense of survival is being able to make fun and create kind of like a dark satire of the world around her for Francisca. And I have to say that this is a very, um, it's a very Colombian thing to do. We are, we find dark humor all the time in things that are very painful for us um, because the country has such a like bloody history and such a hard history that is very much ingrained, I feel like culturally who we are, that we just have to find a lot of humor and joy in really horrible things. And an example of that would be back in March, um, when, you know, when the pandemic was only just like this, like maybe funny thing, <laughs> um, yeah. when it was like something very different. I remember my mother sent me a chain for through WhatsApp, right? And it said like, you know, Switzerland finding a cure for the, for the, for COVID, United States finding a vaccine, whatever other country finding a vaccine and Colombia finding the cumbia for, for coronavirus. And then she sent me the cumbia song, like somebody had made a cumbia about the virus, you know? And that just really goes to exemplify like kind of like the cultural, um, like texture that comes up for me with, uh, that I kind of like channel in the book uh, and trying to find like joy and humor in really dark places. And I think that right now, I mean, we were talking a little bit, I feel like right now, um, it's been kind of like an ebb and flow for me in terms of what's going on. Sure. Um, and we were just discussing that 
more and more it it becomes evident that I have to make it a priority to be able to find joy and spaces of connection. Like it has to be something that I'm like intentionally seeking out and that I'm intentionally crafting space and in my routine and in my days that are filled with things that are giving me joy um, and that I have to intentionally set that out to do for myself. Yeah, I mean, just in the little passage that you read, you mention um, the constant anxiety that comes just from living in Bogota. And I and uh, I have never been to Bogota. I'm sure many of your readers have never been to Bogota. But there's something about, uh, you know, I think that rings true for everybody now. Do you feel that that kind of, that specific anxiety and danger, is that, do you think that's more globally understood in this moment? I mean, I feel like it's a different kind of anxiety, right? Yeah. Like I, the anxiety that Francisca is um, talking about, it's an anxiety that she understands. She understands the scope. She understands how it works. And, you know, when I was living in Colombia and even when I go back, like I do have anxiety. There's a lot of other stuff, but it's like, it's a known thing. And in, in some ways I can see its shape. The anxiety that I feel like a lot of us are under right now is this shapeless, amorphous, huge thing that is just swallowing us and drowning us. And every single day is like a new freaking thing, you know? So it's like, in a sense, maybe the feeling is parallel, but its magnitude and its shape and its form is just like completely different. Okay. And, and what, I mean, this is probably an impossible Venn diagram to separate, but I feel like there is a um, Colombian uh, humor and joy and um, defiance and resistance. And then there's like a queer humor and joy and defiance and resistance. And, um, you know, I think for anybody who's going to be both Colombian and queer, that's going to be inseparable the way it is for anybody who's from anywhere and doing anything. But I'm curious where, where you see that intersection, what you see is different. How do you see that being graded together? In the book? Yeah. I mean, I, I feel that they go hand in hand because it's just, what has influenced me and what has influenced the voice of the book. I mean, there's a chapter that begins with um, the category is. So if you are not, if you don't understand queer culture, you're not going to know what that is. And that's, of course, like echoing um, voguing and echoing, you know, like uh, voguing bowls. And so, you know, if you don't know that, you're not going to understand that that's kind of like coming in. Um, and so there is a way that these things are moving in together and I don't, I don't see them as separate of myself and it's really hard for me to be able to tease out what is what, but I definitely have a lot of influence from a queer sensibility, also a queer humor. I mean, queer humor also comes from being able to look at yourself and make fun of yourself, you know, from being able to like look at um, and society itself and being able to make fun of it. I mean, uh, that's a lot of like what camp comes from, right? And I'm very influenced by camp. And I think that that kind of like the absurdity of camp really um, influenced the kind of like the urgency of the language and the playfulness of the language in the book. And do you, um, when you, when you, you say you're really influenced by camp, do you want to talk about a little bit like how that came into your life or what kind of campy bits of culture have been big for you? Yeah, of course. I went to school. Um, so I moved here uh, 11 years ago from Miami and I went to UC Berkeley and I took a class with a professor called Juana Maria Rodriguez that was about queer visual culture where we watch porn and we watch also Vagino Davis performances and we watch like campy drag kings doing like merman things and I, that was when I first arrived to San Francisco. I didn't even know what that kind of sensibility was. And when she, in that specific class, I started like seeing that world. And then I would go to San Francisco from Berkeley and go to the club and just watch drag queens on stage, just be completely absurd. What was also really attractive of the queens was the way that they would take language and mold it in this without having any concern for its grammar or if anybody kind of like understood what it meant. It was just a matter of being able to um, create some sort of sense of humor and to create like ambience, you know? And so I, 
I love that. And I love that a lot of it had to do with the ways that things sounded. And so camp was at the beginning of it. Like, I just loved that it was very energetic. It was very energetic. I love the quiche aspect of it and like kind of like how it's like tacky. Um, and I feel that I'm also very attracted to like the tackiness in Colombian blend, which is what I use a lot. The, the Spanish that is being thrown here is a lot of like auntie Spanish. It's a lot of like tia Spanish. And it's a lot of like, you know, where my grandmother, all, all that. And a lot of it is kind of like a little tacky. And so I'm very also attracted to that. So maybe that comes sensibility, like developing a sensibility that is attracted to things that are kind of off really helped me look at language in a different way. I don't know if that makes sense. No, I think it does. Um, and you're the um, uh, author, I guess, or, or editor, I mean, both kind of, you compiled that, this fantastic oral history that I hope is also part of the Booksmith um, link of uh, Latina immigrants, um, queer uh, oral histories. And I was curious, did that come from your work at Berkeley and going to drag shows? Like, how did that become, you were so, I mean, you were, if you don't mind my saying, you were so young when you were doing that. And it was self-published originally. I know it really um, took off in San Francisco. And, um, and now you've completely, I, I think, like sealed your place as an historian and a chronicler of this time, as well as an artist, an artist and a, a participant. Um, Thank so you. Here's where that came from, and yeah, I mean, Cuentamelo was born, and I feel that a lot of the influence from the book of the oral histories has really seeped in into um, the work that I did with the novel. And Cuentamelo was born when I, I I came to San Francisco, kind of like running away from my very homophobic family in Miami, and I was here very much in the tradition of a lot of queer people. I was kind of like welcomed and I met my queer mother who is a trans woman from Cuba. And if anybody here knows Cubans and knows people from the Caribbean, I believe the Caribbean people have the best Spanish because it's the most, the one that has the most rhythm and it's the one that has the most invention of words. Like it's amazing the way the Caribbean people speak. And so I would be sitting at my mom's house, my queer mom, and I met a bunch of people through her, like people who are over 60 here, who, when I was reading about queer history, I never, I never saw their stories represented there at all. And the stories were just really good and funny. They were just absurd. And there were horrible things that had happened to them. You know, like, Adela tells the story about, like, you know, being in a boat, coming from Cuba, and, like, watching people puke, and, like, all these things, and then being put in, like, uh, a camp for, like, refugees. But even as she's telling you this, she's like, you know, I was cruising in the camp. I found myself a husband. I was So there's this way that, like, in order to be able to deal with like so much pain, there's there's a way that humor also seeps in and that's also a very like queer sensibility. And so I love their stories also because there was so much humor in it and their language was so specific. Um, and they were using a lot of English. And so I started recording them and then, you know, I got a grant and I self-published and then like uh, Lud picked it up and published it. And so um, I've just been very interested in, in the history of language too and in the way that language which like Spanish, English, and Spanglish has evolved within queerness as well. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's a, um, it's a fantastic book. I saw that the, that the link went up and I have to say that it was um, like, I, I, I bought it and, um, and I knew you and I knew you were doing work with Radar, but like the book, like when I bought it, it was like kind of a book to have, you know, like I was like, this is like an essential book. Everyone should have this book. It's gonna be on my shelf. And then like I opened it and it was so funny and so lively and like so much more fun than I think many of us are used to like the oral history, which is like, we're gonna be immersed and it's really important that it's there, but it's like long and it's kind of weighty. And this was just like, uh, like gobbling candy. I just thought it was marvelous. So I'm glad that um, there's a link to that as well. Um, you were talking about language. Um, I want to talk a little bit about uh, Spanglish because, um, I mean, even as a as a white kid, in case you can't tell, from growing up in San Francisco, um, 
I felt like that was such a cultural force, that language that was different from learning Spanish or different if, you know, if you're a non-native speaker of Spanish, like certainly different from the way you approach languages and it was such a huge part of the culture. And it's something that you see so rarely portrayed in American literature. You can see it kind of here and there in television and movies a little bit, but like, it's just something that's completely absent from literature, even it feels like from Latinx literature. And so do you want to talk a little bit about kind of, was it, were you, did you feel like you could just jump in and do that in a novel or did, or did you feel hesitant about it? I mean, you mean I'm going to turn on the lights, you guys. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, they're like times. Um, I agree with you. I mean, I feel like there's not enough English. And yeah. the, thing, the thing that happens is that I came here when I was 15. And so I'm 32 right now. And so literally my life has been like half and half. And I started learning English very much from the outside. And my, what I am attracted to, the sensibility that I'm attracted to is just things that are like on the, like on the margins. And Spanish, Spanglish, I remember hearing it on the streets of Miami and I remember listening first to just the Cubans do that because the Cubans have been doing a lot of that since like the 60s there and I was in shock I was in shock I didn't know what was going on and I didn't know why I was so attracted to that and then I started hearing like my grandmother make up words here and then I started hearing like my mom from a, and like we all now, because I migrated from like my, a place where everybody spoke my language, I migrated to a place where like, I didn't know, I spoke like, you know, some English and, but I was learning the language. It was just like a very different engagement with what was going on. And so, um, I mean, I, I have a lot of, I, I mean, I think we all know why Spanglish is not that it's like the same, like I feel um, institutionalized like racism and like xenophobia than other places and like the, the fear of something different um, and allowing, I think, like the readers to be able to have that kind of experimentation. Uh, but the, the experimentation for me with Fiere was very much about being able to see my own like language legitimized too and my own approach to language. Um, and so I was going to, if you all want, I have a little list of like Spanglish lesson yes please for everybody today so i wrote it down you know, good 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 and um there's just like four short points so this is a, a short um a short lesson so the first thing there are some that are like literally the entire idiom is like translated or the entire saying is translated so the entire sentence so for instance i'll call you back will be translated literally to spanish which is te llamo para atrás te llamo para atrás so it's literally the same thing is translated into spanish um, which is just, that's not how you say in Spanish, I will call you back at all. So it sounds completely awkward. And so in Spanish, if you have, if you don't live in the U.S., you, you're going to, like, if you're a Spanish, if you go to Colombia and say, te llamo para atrás, people are going to be like, what the fuck is he saying? <laughs> like, it makes no sense. So even if you don't speak, if you don't speak Spanish, like, it just doesn't make any sense in Spanish. But that's how people say it. Then there's the other one that is, for instance, like, I have to plancha it, give me the trapo, mamas, or chanclas, which is a very, I've seen like a very, um, most like Mexican American Chicanos use that a lot more. Yeah. Um, and it's say just, it again, has, like, you, sorry, will you say it again and maybe put it up to the camera because the, yeah. the Zoom audio is not. I can put it in the chat. Hard. So, for instance, you say, you say, I have to plancha it. So, plancha it. Give me the trapo. So the, the, the ones that are um, all caps are the ones in Spanish. Right. And then mom wants her in chanclas. And so what happens here, oh, sorry, that's not, that's not what it is, it's chanclas. It's, um, so what happens here is like you have the English grammar. So it's like it's, it's grammatically in English, but then you just replace um, one word for one in Spanish. And all of those words, what I, why I, I related to a lot of people in, in California is because those are words that are, um, they're, they're vocabulary of the house, you know? And that's what a lot of people who grew up in this country and have parents who are migrants from Mexico, a lot of people have the vocabulary of the house. You know, they don't know maybe university like like 
uh, Spanish. They don't know the kind of Spanish, but they do know what things around the house are. And so like that's another form of English. Um, the other one is phonetics. So Los Miami, um, which is Miami. So Miami is spelled like this, but you can pronounce it in Spanish. Many people who don't know how to like pronounce it in English will say Miami or Miami. And so Los Miami is another way of just writing phonetically in Spanish. Mm -hmm. what's in English but the other one will be which is amazing that I love it's Thanksgiving because ask a Latina mom to say Thanksgiving right. mom, mom says Thanksgiving or just like okay you know so Thanksgiving Los Miami's okay so that's another way of using Spanglish which is like you write phonetically in Spanish the English words and that's another way of incorporating and then the last one which is similar to I have to planchate is um so so for instance, stop with the pendejada. So I'm putting it right there. Pendejada is like stop, uh, like stop annoying me, stop with the bullshit, kinda. Um, but really, that's literally translated from Spanish. Deja la pendejada will be in Spanish, but you're just taking the uh, Spanish grammar and just putting in the English. Stop with the pendejada. Right. So that's another way. So for the, so I just wanted to point those like point four things out. Um, but very much for me in the book was about rhythm and was about, I was using the Spanglish to propel the rhythm forward of the book. And I, and yeah, it was a lot around like phonetics and it was a lot, a lot around how things were sounding for me. Um, so that's a little bit. And then if you're writing, if you're writing it the other way, it's not Spanglish, it's called Ingleñol. Well, you know, it's Espanol plus Ingles. Right. So it's Espanol. In Spanish, plus English is written like this. English is written like this, so it will be this. Yeah. And in English, it's like it's like it's a much better word than Spanglish, in my opinion. Really? Yeah. Well, they're both. So that's how you do it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, because I think Indian y'all is a much better word than Spanglish. Like Spanglish has, when you look at it, it looks like spam or. So, there's something about it that looks awkward and the um and the sh at the end of it which is not that just feels wrong for the um flow like that i mean it's like i think that it's also i mean i think that it speaks to i think that it sounds like that because like it's mostly using english with a lot of spanish but it also the connotation historically the person who coined that term was a puerto rican dude in the 40s who was writing and making fun of the way that Puerto Ricans were being taught um, English and how they were, there very much was like a broken language. Like he was really advocating for purity of language. So it seems like ironic and incredible that this dude who basically was making fun of people using English and advocating for like purity of language coined a term that now it's being used by a bunch of Latinos to just mean like the mixture of both of our languages. But historically, the dude that coined it was wanted completely the opposite of what we're doing, basically. Yeah. Um, I think I'm just interested in it, for me anyway, because it's very, it's a familiar story to, Jim, to for Jewish immigrants, Yiddish, right? And, and like Yiddish is really a word for Jewish. So like the, the so language that was like based from all these Eastern European languages and came kind of crawling together. And, um, you know, it's mostly a dead language now. It's been codified, you can study it, but that was never the way it acted in the culture. And I think that a lot of these um, languages or, or ways of speaking, um, they have this short window as a similar, like the more assimilated everybody is, the less there's gonna be that, that there's just going to be less xenophobia about it. And so it's going to make its own impact and it's just going to disappear as a kind of it's a discrete thing. So I love that your book is chronicling this moment, which um, I mean, has been going on my whole lifetime, but I still feel like it's probably a short moment in terms of the way that Spanish and English are working together. It's, it's, it's going to be something else. I mean, I feel like I really think that the fact that a lot of people, most people that are speaking to me are like, oh, wow, the language, and it make, it's incredible because I really have not invented this at all. And what's also incredible is like, there's like 40 million Latinos or Latin, Latin American descendants in this country. And so the fact that like our impact in literature is so small, 
it feels like i'm like why why is that like people have been writing like this since the turn of the 19th century but yet the literary establishment has not caught up with it so it just really it just really speaks to the way that like the literary the literary literary establishment like works um because everybody should have read some of this stuff before yeah i mean when you read that the way the language um works, it makes me feel like if I had never read um, a novel that had the internet in it or something. Do you know what I mean? I'm just like, we're just gonna sort of ignore this huge thing that everybody's doing, but it's going on all the time. So um, my hat is off. But, but, but I wanted to ask, and I think we're gonna open up for questions um, soon, but I mean, part of the experience of Spanglish in your book and part of your reading it is this very performative way and you've done so much um, um, kind of actual performance that I've seen. I, I had no idea if you were gonna be in drag tonight. Um, so I didn't know how that was gonna go, but, but, um, but and then all your work in Radar where I feel like there's all this queer literature and culture being represented, but it's very performative. It's very um, oral history. Or, or oral performance. And I was curious kind of if you felt limited in making a novel that is on the page, it, does that feel like only part of the, of, the, of the life of the story? Is the performative aspect like another part? Well, you know, for the book lunch, we had two drag queens that we're gonna be doing um, a live church show. So I, I definitely know that there's a huge performative aspect to it. But I feel that the constraint of like having to write something down actually made it more creative for me. So that's, you know, it's like when you give somebody a writing prompt that is so incredibly specific, then you yield for more creativity because of its specificity. Um, and I am just really, I've been just really fascinated with the way that orality and textuality relate to one another, the way that spoken, I mean, I, I love listening to people speak and I love really good storytellers. And that has always been um, something that has really attracted me. And I am very pulled by it. And I'm very pulled by it because sometimes like, and again, I'll, I, I bring up my queer mom and my grandmother who was also a great storyteller, which is that they both had you when they were telling you a story and many times they weren't saying anything. I didn't even, I was like, what is this really about? But it didn't really matter because you wanted to just hear them speak for hours and hours and hours on end. And I, and I wanted to get some of that texture, some of that feel into the page and some of that like urgency that performance and that storytelling many times has. Um, I also come from a country where we have uh, what is called cuenteros, which are storytellers on the street. And I remember being a kid and after church on Sundays, Catholic church, the same Catholic church, um, I would come out and there were dudes who would tell stories on the church set with like not, they had like props and things. They didn't even have a, a page. And so I feel that like a lot of my, of me growing up and the way that I, I entered my love for language was through spoken word and then and then books came to me and just like exploded. Um, but I really am very attached, attracted to spoken word um, and kind of like the poetry that exists in, in everybody's speech because we all have that in us. Um, it just sometimes is activated more than others. And so there's definitely a performance aspect to it. And I would love when this whole thing, you know, once we're on the other side, if we're on the other side, um, I want to just be able to perform it and read it in many places, you know, and read it out loud because I do think that this book wants to be read out loud. Um, and, you know, we'll see, we'll see what happens. Um, yeah, I hope so. I hope you'll record it. If not perform it everywhere, I would love yeah. um, an audio version. Um, I want to ask you a little bit about um, the project that you're working on now. Um, it seems like a thousand years ago that you and I had coffee right before the release of this book. And, but um, you were telling me about the work that you're, that you went back and did in Colombia and, and the book that's coming out of that. Will you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. Um, so we were just discussing this previously and I am writing a new, new novel and it's also in Spanglish and it happens all in Colombia. So I went there for two months to do some research. Um, and it's the story of this girl who grows up with her dad. Her mom dies when she's eight and the dad was kind of like a closeted bag for many years. And so when the mom dies, 
she's been raised by the father's um, extended friends, which are a bunch of trans women and gay men. And so the story is being told by the 12 year old girl and the 60 something year old trans woman. And it's kind of like an investigation of Poppy's story and it's called Poppy right now. And it's an investigation of the dad's story, which is very dark and it has all this like hidden gay things. And so I went there to do research on the um, underground like party scene and queer scene in the 70s and 80s, what was happening gay, like gay wise because the dad um, go, like you go back to see the father in the 70s and in the 80s kind of like having his like gay awakening and being very closeted. Um, and so I went back there and it was just really beautiful to connect with my own culture and my own roots in a very different way. Uh, I usually go and just visit my family, you know, with my friends, but this time like I was engaging with um, the city and I lived there for two months. So I was physically there for two months. Um, and also something that I was telling Daniel at the beginning is like, the evidence to me was like the beginning of this experimentation. I didn't even know that this thing was going to be published and I had no idea that people were going to actually resonate with it. I did it for my own sake and because I loved the story, I was just following the story. There are many times when I would write something and I was like, what the fuck? And like, nobody's going to read this, but I just loved it so much that I just kept going. And I feel that this new book that I'm writing, the Spanglish is just like, it just explodes in another way because I've, I've more than given myself permission. I'm just seeping in it very much. Um, from just having this other book, so we'll see. It's gonna take. It's gonna take years. I don't. I don't even know how long it's gonna take. It's nowhere near like finished at all. But you know, it's there. I'm excited. <laughs> I'm sorry, it's not finished. <laughs> um, I'm looking over at questions now. Lisa Brown asks, "Hey, wait a minute." Um, uh, she says, "I was fascinated by the baptism ritual in the book, which is." Um, striking for sure um and would you talk a little bit more about that it's such a yeah it's yeah such a cool beginning. so for folks who don't know the baptism the the story basically opens with the entire family the mom the grandmother the sister and francisca they're kind of like getting everything ready to do and do baptism of the mother's miscarriage baby she lost the baby 17 years prior and so they're now going to baptize it and I remember, so this, I, the entire novel came out of a short story that I wrote about the baptism. So the baptism is kind of like the entry point into the novel. So thank you, Lisa, for asking that question. Um, and I remember when I was in my MFA, I was writing the short story. And I remember my mom once, uh, when, we, when she was going to the church, talking to us about baptizing dead babies, about the fact that if you lose a baby, you still have to name it and baptize it. Um, and I just thought it was incredible, um, that they would go all the way there, but we never actually went through any sort of baptism. Um, but when I was writing the story, I was like, oh, I want to imagine what it would have been like to actually go through a baptism of a dead baby. Um, but when I was, you know, in the church, they actually brought it up and I, and I just remember my mom talking about it, um, among other many shocking things that happened at the church. Yeah, I mean, um, that m moment at the beginning of the book is such, um, I feel like it is like a bullseye on exactly the kind of culture and language and playfulness that you're talking. Like there's something so hilarious and performative about it, but obviously there's so much pain and turmoil and um, uh, passion or emotional upset, trauma, even at the center of it that I just think, um, yeah. I mean, and that's something that like, it was, it was something that I did through the edits of the book, right? Like the revisions really got me to making it more nuanced and more complex because it is funny and it's kind of outrageous to baptize a dead baby. And yet I didn't want it to just like be a spectacle, right? Like I didn't want them to just be like a spectacle or like a two dimensional character. I want them, I wanted everybody in there to, to like, to just be full on human beings, to be complex. Um, and to be able for us as readers to see their pain and their longing and their sadness. Um, and I, and I was trying to figure out how to like balance all that. Yeah. Do you think, I mean, um, we're coming to the end here and that there's something about the kind of, um, the joy and the defiance in this book that I think has really stuck with me. And just when I was 
looking over the book today and thinking more about it, that was really what I took home from it. And obviously some of it is because of the times we're in and the, and you know, the strange relation that literature has with just such a solitary activity. And now we're all spending so much time alone. Um, and, but I'm wondering if that, I mean, I don't like to push authors to say some big statement that they want to make, but is there something about that humanity, particularly among people who've been denied that kind of humanity for so long, right? You take the language of scorn and the dismissal and you tell the lives of these people who are so invisible in our society. And yet it, you, um, there's n the book doesn't feel scolding, you know, it feels, it feels open and it feels so um, alive to the possibility of happiness. And um, I don't even know if that's a question. <laughs> but I, just, I, mean, I just feel so, the, the book is, feels like, like opening the windows and letting the air in. It feels so good to read this book. Thank you. I mean, I feel, I, I follow the story more than anything else. Like I, I, I didn't set out to write like any sort of like specific statement. I wanted to just follow the specific story and the characters just grew so big. And I, I was just following them. I was just following Francisca to see where she was being taken. And I was, and I was reading all this other work at the same time. Um, a lot of Latin American writers who have a, like, who just write in slang. And a lot of that was like circulating in my head as I was writing a lot of this, you know? And so it was also me, existing in this very in-between state of being an immigrant here but having roots somewhere else and like people who are immigrants understand that you're always in this state of longing for something else like you're always in a state of longing you're always in this in-between that you're never really belong and i was also just trying to find some sort of belonging in language i feel and searching for that in other latin american writers and other people here um i managed to kind of like carve something for myself in this book that brought me joy because I liked reading it and I was having fun. You know, there were like, when I wrote the uh, grandmother's chapter was one of my favorites and I had so much fun writing it. Like I was laughing by myself. And so, you know, it's like, it's a nerd's dream. Um, yeah. That's so great, yeah. And there's a question here about the explosion of bilingual color is what it's um, described that. And I think that you've, um, you've answered that question, but that's such a beautiful way to describe it. Um, and speaking of color, do you want to talk about, you're doing a postcard. Um, oh, yeah. Reasons we no longer have to explain. You cannot get your book signed via Zoom right now. However, there's this thing uh, that Huli is doing. and um... Yeah, so um, I wanted to end with talking a little bit about this postcard project that we're launching next week with the Feminist Press. And so my friend Katie Fricas, who's a cartoonist in New York, um, did some drawings of the book. So this is Francisca. If everybody can see it. Um, and then this is Carmen and Francisca, and that's the scene where she's kind of taking off her shirt. Um, and so if you buy a book by July 1st, starting in July 1st, um, I'm going to put the link on my Instagram, and there's going to be a form. You just fill out your form, and I, I'll send you one of these. And I also have, it comes with a stamp of a palm tree, of the same palm tree, and it's shiny and pink and pretty. <laughs> and so since I can't, since I can't sign your book, y'all, um, I'm going to be doing this and we're just going to do it until I run out of postcards. So Monday, starting Monday, you can get one of these signed by me. You just have to have bought a book starting July 1st and not have bought it on Amazon. Fair. So, for your local bookstores, <laughs> anywhere but Amazon. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, uh, it's, um, I hope everyone runs out and um, purchases this book who haven't already. It's, um, I mean, I, I sound like a salesman, but I mean, I think it's a wonderful gift. Um, I've watched so many people who, um, who I've put this book in their hands and who have been lit up by it. And um, it's such a, a privilege. I knew for years, I knew something was coming from you and I didn't know what it was, um, but I knew it was gonna be marvelous. And it's so wonderful to see it um, arriving here. And it's such a pleasure to speak with you. Thank you. It was and wonderful to see to you, you too. And Evan, uh, Evan is a uh, force in this town of getting books into the hands of people, and we're forever grateful. I mean, I think I've known you, Evan, now for like 20 years. And you've been doing this kind of gig, and it, I'm forever grateful. 
Thanks. Uh, so thanks everybody for coming. Give it up for Huli. Thank you everybody. This has been really wonderful. Thank you, Danny, for speaking with me. Um, this was really beautiful. Thank you, Booksmith, for always holding it down. You guys have been like super supportive from the beginning, so I really appreciate you. Um, and then, yeah, come back on Monday. Check out the Instagram. We're gonna have the forum there, and you know, the Booksmith is also gonna do some promotion on it. So if you get it from the Booksmith, even better. Um, and then, thank you, everybody. We'll see you on the other side. Yeah. All right. Good night, everybody. I've got nothing to add. Just, just thank you, thank you, Daniel, thank you, Huli, and congratulations. And thanks to those of you who joined us. Um, check out our upcoming events at Booksmith.com, and uh, hopefully we can all meet in person sometime soonish. But until then, hope to see you again on the Zoom. Much love and um, have a good night, y'all. Thank you. I know. Bye.